Shaping Your Family. That's our topic today. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day. To not be satisfied with throwing a little religion into life, that's just a shallow substitute for what God wants for our lives. As the series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. One of the most important topics of life is the family. Have you ever wanted to ask Elizabeth a question, but you never were able to do it? Well, today Elizabeth will be answering some of the questions that came to her over the years as she thinks about the family and about submission and God's will. So stay tuned for that, too. Gateway to Joy programs on the way. Also, we'll be hearing from Donna Otto, one of Elizabeth's friends. Uh, she spoke during the Wheaton Memorial Service in 2015 the velvet brick about sacrifice and about Amy Carmichael. Also longtime Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger will be joining us. Uh, he'll be speaking Quechua and talking about the new year. Uh, that coming later. First though, part one of our question and answer series. This is Gateway to Joy 1291. Shaping Your Family was the series that this came from. We'll be hearing about that uh, touchy subject of submission and about God's will. First of all, let me say I cannot answer everybody's questions, not only because of time, but because of just plain ignorance. Secondly, I will try to give you a scriptural answer. If I can't give you a scriptural answer, I may give you an Elizabeth Elliot opinion, which is worth nothing. You can discard it at will. I would trust you would be a little bit slower to discard a question which has a biblical answer. And if I seem to have given you short shrift, the back of my hand, or to have taken a question which is extremely important and serious for you in too light a manner, please forgive me. Very often there's a great deal more behind a question than I can possibly guess at. But time requires that I deal as quickly as I can. So I'm just going to read these. There's no particular order in them. All I did was go through and sort out Valerie and Elizabeth and all the ones that are not addressed to either one of them. How does our free will when we sin affect the working of God's sovereign will as set forth in Romans 8.28, which says that everything that happens fits into a pattern for good? Now here, of course, is the theological question of the ages. <laughs> the sovereign will of God, and the freedom of man to choose. And my husband, Addison Leach, was a philosopher, and he said, nobody will ever sort this out for you intellectually. But he said, as Christians, we drive a stake into the ground on the sovereign will of God. There is no question about that. It is taught clearly in Scripture. We drive in another stake on God's gift of free will. He gave Adam and Eve the freedom to choose either to love him or not to love him, the freedom to choose to obey him or to disobey him. They chose to disobey him. That does not in any way detract from the sovereign will of God because God planned a universe in which it was possible for people to defy him. So one of the most crucial and definitive texts in all of scripture is in chapter 50 of Genesis. You remember that the free will of Joseph's brothers caused him tremendous suffering. They had murder in their hearts. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to kill him. They finally ended up dropping him into a pit. Then they sold him. He went into slavery. He was lied about by an adulterous woman. As a result of her sin, he was put into prison. And some of his fellow prisoners had promised that they would help get him out when they got out, and they forgot to do that. And years and years and years went by, and Joseph suffered because of other people's sins. But in the end, you remember that the fact that he was in that position enabled him to save the lives of his father and his brothers. And he said, you meant it for evil, and God meant it for good. In God's mind, there is no situation that any human being can ever devise that will stultify the working out of his will. So that's the best answer I can give you. You may find a theologian that can do better, but my husband, Ed, taught me that much anyway. And this same person puts a question, should a wife refuse to submit to her husband if what he asks of her clearly violates God's law, for example, to lie or steal, etc.? 
And that is a very tough question because in 1 Peter 3, wives are told to submit to their husbands even if they are being abusive. Uh, the word abusive is not used in most of the translations in that chapter, but he starts it by saying, in the same way, meaning in the same way that he has instructed slaves. Slaves are to be respectful and obedient to abusive masters. And he said, in the same way, you wives are to submit to your husbands. And he uses, and this is the answer to the question, the example of Sarah, whose husband Abraham did ask her to do some very foolish and wrong things. And we are to follow the example of Sarah and trust the consequences of our husband's decision to God and not to give way to hysterical fears. You speak often of reading Christian biographies. Are there particular ones you would recommend? Well, thank you for that question because it gives me a chance to recommend two that I've written. <laughs> um, my book, Shadow of the Almighty, was actually the first book that I wrote and it is the biography of my husband, Jim Elliott, and I have had literally hundreds of men tell me that no book outside of the Bible has so profoundly influenced their lives. And I've had three very well-known radio preachers tell me that that was the book that was crucial in their spiritual life. Um, Chuck Swindoll, James Kennedy, and Charles Stanley all have told me personally that that book influenced their lives. In fact, James Kennedy quoted to me almost a whole paragraph from Jim's biography, and the title is Shadow of the Almighty. The other biography is the story of the woman whose life has had the most profound impact in my own spiritual training outside of my own parents. She was Amy Carmichael of India. My biography of her is called A Chance to Die. But I know that among the biographies that affected my own life were uh, Betty Scott Stamm, John and Betty Stamm of China, Hudson Taylor of China, Mary Slessor of Calabar, David Brainerd, uh, Borden of Yale. I could go on and on. The great thing about reading biographies is that you can see the whole span of a person's life from birth to death and see in small, comprehensible form the workings of God. And that helps us study the biographies of the Bible. It's wonderful to see the way God prepared and called different people. I would love to request that your next book tell about the Howard family. Is that a consideration? It's been done, and the book is down on the book table. The shaping of a Christian family is the story of the Howard family, the home in which I grew up. How did you fulfill your ministry and raise your daughter to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not really sure whether there's a connection between those two clauses, um, certainly fulfilling my ministry was raising my daughter. Raising my daughter is fulfilling my ministry, among other things. And ministry to me is never with a capital M. All ministry means is service. That's what the word means. Unfortunately, we've gotten it very highly specialized and very narrow in our definition in these days where people have the idea that they must be able to write books or sing or preach or be missionaries, or do something which other people would recognize as ministry, whereas Jesus made it crystal clear that getting down and washing the disciples' feet was what he was telling us we should all be doing. In other words, the dirtiest job, the lowest job, the humblest job, the job for which nobody is ever going to thank you or give you any special credits, those are ministry. It doesn't make any difference to God whether I'm speaking to a seminar like this or peeling an onion, provided I'm doing the right thing at the right time. If it's time for me to make Lars's soup, and I have to make Lars's soup practically every day, because he, he wouldn't dream of opening a can, um, I have to peel onions. So I start peeling an onion. If that's my job, then that is my ministry. If my job is to write a book, that is my ministry at that moment, but I don't think God is impressed with the writing of a book any more than he is with the peeling of an onion, so long as it's offered to him. That's what makes all the difference. As a single, never-been-married 31-year-old woman, I know I'm under the spiritual headship of God, and the man on earth that I'm under is my father. How do I balance or maintain seeking, submitting to God's will through my father? This person doesn't tell me whether she lives at home or not. I, I personally don't 
think that you are under the authority in the sense of strict obedience to your parents if you are not under their roof. It makes good sense if your father's paying the bills and you're still living in your parents' house that you would do what your parents want. That's just simple courtesy. That doesn't have anything to do with the principle of submission. But um, a single woman is not only under the spiritual headship of God, she is under the spiritual headship of the men in her church, the men whom God has entrusted with the responsibility of being elders or deacons or whatever. Uh, he is the one who is responsible, and it is to him that you answer, and it is in the theater of the church that you are to play out your part as a woman. The home is a theater in which the drama of Christ in the church is being enacted, this mystery in which we women represent the bride, you men represent the bridegroom, Christ himself. So you stand in a very solemn position. As C.S. Lewis has put it, women may represent the people to God. We may not represent God to the people. There is a very special way, a very special uh, designation which has been laid upon you men that you stand in the place of Christ because you are, as a husband, you love your wife as Christ loved the church, etc. So there's, there should be any conflict or any difficulty in balancing and maintaining your submission. If the case is that you're under your father's roof and you have some conflict as to whether, whether you should make this decision or that one, and your father says you should make this one and you want to do that one, I don't know what to tell you there except to pray that the Lord will reveal to you whether you're supposed to literally obey your father in that. But don't forget that Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, then the time comes when you have to be willing to forsake your father and your mother. The first of our two-part question and answer series, that was about shaping your family. And we'll have 1296, uh, also a conference question and answer session uh, later on. First, though, let's hear from Donna Otto, a good friend of Elizabeth Elliot, and she spoke at the Wheaton Memorial Service for Elizabeth in July of 2015. Have you heard about the Velvet Brick? She introduced me to people and passages and books and authors and ideas. In the margins of all my Bibles are E.E. -E, places that she encouraged me to read and memorize. And her works, especially Amy Carmichael's work in Acceptance, Life, Peace, altered the course of my life. Altered the course of my life. She reminded me that I should not carry a Bible unless I had swept under the bed. And long before Eugene Peterson wrote the message, she was quoting J.B. Phillips, and do not be conformed to your world, not just the big world. And she was challenging me to know what my world was. I saw at the end of her life full acceptance a peacefulness that I understood more clearly because of Amy Carmichael's quote. And Amy said in her great book called If, if I refuse to allow one who is dear to me to suffer for the sake of Christ, if I do not see suffering as the greatest honor that can be offered to any follower of the crucified Christ, then I know nothing of Calvary love. The mother of my heart had accepted suffering in a true and deep way, aided by those who loved her. Her writing is high quality, her content fit to change your life. Her voice and antics with accents would make you howl, but none can compare to the choices she made to surrender to Jesus Christ beneath the cross. And she showed me that, she modeled that, she encouraged it, she stayed with me until the end. Elizabeth was a brick. She was tough and tender, and I was forever changed by the presence of God in her, in my life. A good friend of Elizabeth, Donna Otto, speaking in July of 2015 at the Wheaton Memorial Service for Elizabeth Elliot. We'll be hearing later on from Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger, who spent uh, 30 years in the country. He'll be a speaking Quechua for us and have a greeting 
uh, for the new year. First, though, more of our conference question and answer time about shaping your family. How do you discipline temper tantrums constructively? My mother took the view that no child will continue a temper tantrum very long if there is no audience. So she would immediately put the child into what she called the crying room, which was a little sort of a pantry, and she shut the door. And another, uh, Valerie told me that just her next to youngest, her 19-month-old, is the only one, I think, that she said has actually stiffened out and started to scream. And I saw this happen only once at, at their house. He was in the high chair. He didn't want to eat what she had given him. And she looked him straight in the eye, and she said, Theo, I want you to eat what I have put on your plate. And he continued to scream. She picked him out of the high chair. She took him over and sat him down on the sofa while he's kicking and screaming. And she looked him straight in the eye, and she spoke to him in a very quiet voice. And he still didn't stop, so she took him out of earshot into another room. Well, now, um, today I asked her again about this, and she said that she has now told him I am going to spank you if you don't stop this. And he is still not a talker. He, he just makes noises. But the minute she gets that stick, she said he goes, hum, <laughs> which is his way of saying, OK, I'm going to straighten up. So uh, those are steps to take. Um, definitely, I think the child should be spanked. If, if the child in the pantry doesn't stop screaming very quickly, then I would go in and spank him. Do you believe planning the number of children you have using birth control is not yielding to God's sovereign control? Or is it sometimes wise to control this natural law of reproduction in some cases? And here's another one of those almost unanswerable questions. But I do have this to say about planning or spacing the number of your children. I think there is an extremely important and usually ignored difference between contraception and natural family planning. Natural family planning is not contraception. It is making use of a mechanism that God has built into the human reproductive system. The spiritually important difference, I think, between the two things, when you use uh, chemical and mechanical means for contraception, there is no cooperation required between husband and wife, nor is there the requirement of sacrifice and self-restraint and suffering. You are thereby being arbiters of the number of children. There is a big difference between being an arbiter and being a minister. And by being ministers, that means we are being servants of this mechanism, which God in his wisdom has built into the rhythmic system of reproduction. And that method, natural family planning, requires self-restraint, sacrifice, and unity between the husband and wife, agreement. That's all I'm going to say on that subject. Our usher at church just informed us his wife of 50 years has left him. He feels it a mental problem. What could we offer him on reading material? You know, I really don't believe that there is a special gospel for every problem. I believe that the cross of Jesus Christ is our salvation. And I think we've gone way overboard in specializing and having special interest groups and feeling that there's got to be a book and a seminar and a video and a special interest group for every single problem that anybody can think up. I think it's a great mistake. When Christian in Pilgrim's Progress reached the summit of Calvary, he said, the burden fell off. And he looked at the cross and he said, he hath given me rest by his sorrows and life by his death. And the Apostle Paul said, I have determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's really what I would like to say to every question here. It, you know, it comes down to that. God took upon himself. Jesus Christ bore our sins and carried our sorrows. This man has a deep sorrow. But Jesus has already dealt with it at the cross. Come to the cross. And Jesus said, come to me, you who are tired and overburdened. I will give you rest. Take 
my yoke. There are three conditions to receiving that rest. Come to me. Take my yoke. Learn of me, for I am meek and gentle in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. The Lord's been speaking to me a lot about meekness, and I know that the more I respond in faith, the more rest I know, and the greater the peace. How does God deal with suicide? There are a lot of other questions on here. But that's the question. How does God deal with suicide? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. You know, the Bible tells us everything that we need to know. I'm sure it must be a terribly painful thing for someone to know that a loved one has committed suicide, and I would suppose that's probably what's behind this. We can be absolutely sure that the judge of all the earth will do right. And I think Ruth Graham once said, God didn't call him home, but he welcomed him home. What is the man and woman's place at work? My understanding of the distinction between men and women basically that man is supposed to be the initiator and woman the responder, convinces me that it puts a tremendous strain on both men and women when women have authority over men. The Bible doesn't speak directly to this. The Bible speaks perfectly clearly to what is supposed to obtain in the home and in the church. There is no question that a woman is not to usurp authority in the church. She is not to be the one wearing the pants at home. The Bible's clear about that. The Bible doesn't deal with women in the corporate world. There was no such thing. We do know just tiny shreds of truth about Lydia, for example. She was a businesswoman, and the woman in Proverbs 31 apparently had a business going, but it was out of her home, very obviously. All I can say is that my few experiences of being in the corporate world, it's, this is only when I have been on the boards of various organizations, usually I was the only woman, the token female. And I always, just because of my understanding of what femininity means, I always waited till the men had had, to, had their say. If, if they had anything more to say, they, they said everything they wanted to say. If I felt that something had been left unsaid, that I wanted to say, then I would say it. But I don't want to be in that kind of a position. I just think that it does put a strain on everybody. So all I can say is I wouldn't recommend it. I would never take a CEO position myself, no matter what kind of a salary they offered me. But I'm not going to tell you that it's sinful. I just say, do you understand what masculinity really means? Do you understand what femininity means? My husband exasperates our children constantly. They don't really like him, and he doesn't seem to like them much either, although they obey him, and we all do love each other. I interfere by trying to help him understand them and know how to relate to them. This causes lots of problems for us. Help. I have no pat answer for that except to pray. That's a pat answer, I guess. But I do believe that we need to respect the hidden working of God in individual souls. We cannot change other people. Pray for your children. Pray for your husband. Pray that the Lord will help you to keep your mouth shut. Never pass up an opportunity, ladies, to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> mm. Would you also mention the verse immediately prior, verse 21 in Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This puts a more positive light on the command in verse 22 and 25 for me without taking away from what you so well described as God's order in the marital relationship. I understand verse 21 simply to be a general statement that we are to be submissive in our attitudes to one another. This is the road to harmony. But then Paul spells out the particulars. You know, logic usually goes from the general to the particular. 
it was logical for him to say, submit yourselves one to another. Well, in what way do we submit ourselves one to another? There are certain special areas in which the submission is clearly spelled out. One of these is in the marital relationship. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Now, I did point out last night that it is a sacrifice for a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. It does involve sacrifice the laying down of his life, the giving up of his right to himself, to me, we need to be careful not to say that he is therefore to be submissive to his wife. He should be unselfish about his wife's desires and consider them in honesty and in love before God. But let's not get confused. Uh, Paul goes on to another specific, children, obey your parents. There certainly is no way in which the parents are to be submissive to their children. But the parents are sacrificing for their children all the time, aren't they? And slaves, be obedient to your masters. So God is establishing an order, a hierarchical order. And this hierarchical order is visible in the universe. We have God at the top, then we have cherubim, seraphim, archangels, angels, and men. Men a little bit lower than the angels, and below men are all the animals. And that is clearly spelled out in scripture, hierarchical order. And so we have a hierarchical order, which is the glory of heaven. It is a glorious inequality for us women. We are meant to be complementary, and that is our freedom and our peace. That was Gateway to Joy 1296. Well, before we go, let's hear from Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger. He ministered in the Ecuadorian jungle and uh, actually lived in the country for 30 years and still goes back to minister as he loves to do. Well, he's going to uh, speak a little Quechua for us. When Elizabeth came to St. Louis, uh, I heard an advertising on Christian radio, I think it was, uh, where she was going to be down at a hotel uh, downtown for a women's conference. So I went there and uh, just stood in the back and so I just, after that, I just kind of went up to Elizabeth, said, Kawasangitu, Senora Elizabeth. I said it in Quechua. And she looked at me. Then I said, Nuka Pancho Mani. I'm Pancho. And then she recognized uh, the name and uh, who I was. Because it had been years since we said hi, very briefly, uh, my first trip down or visiting. Hey, how would you say Happy New Year in Quechua, Frank? They would use Spanish now, of course, but uh, they would probably say something for a new year. Kushi Mushu Huata. It means Happy New Year. Three words in Quechua. Kushi Mushu Huata. Longtime Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger. Uh, thank you for that. And a happy new year to you, too. Well, it looks as though our time together has come to an end. Let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you jogged, wherever we found you today. It's been good to have spent some time with you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. Elizabeth with an S, Elizabeth Elliot.org. And for more uh, lectures, devotionals, videos, and uh, Gateway to Joy programs, other resources too, that's the place to go. Elizabeth Elliot.org. Now, thank you for uh, taking time to leave a review for us as well as you listen to the podcast. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily you're loved with an everlasting love, and underneath, are the everlasting arms. Kushi Mushu Wata.